if I saw that your fly was undone, I'd be like, Nathan, your fly, right? I would keep it quiet. So it's being radically candid, telling you there's a very specific problem, but I'm here to help you. So my job is to be able to make you successful as a direct report. How can I get you to your goals? Because if I can't get you to your goals, then we can't keep you in the company. Welcome back to the Outsourcing Scaling Show. My guest today is Liam Martin. Liam, how are you doing today? Fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We were just chatting before. I think you and I talked over two years ago, back when we were first starting the Free Up Marketplace. So it's been cool seeing you um, start up your conference and us growing Free Up and kind of meeting up again on this new podcast. So I'm excited to talk to you. For those of you that don't know, Liam is the co-founder and CMO of timedoctor.com. I know a lot of our clients use that. Staff.com and is a co-organizer of runningremote.com, the largest conference on building remote teams. After working with remote workers for over 10 years, Liam works on furthering outsourcing and is passionate about how to gain insights into the inner workings of how people work. We're going to talk all about that and more, but first, let's take a gigantic step back what were you like growing up as a kid? Were you a straight A student? Were you a rebel? Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I was a pair skater. I was a figure skater up until about the age of 20, uh, in which I broke my kneecap and uh, got kicked out of the Olympic training program and had a huge readjustment of my life. Because up until that point, I was basically being bred for a specific pers- purpose, which was... <clears throat> the Olympics and working and training internationally. And then all of that kind of fell apart. I was no longer a uh, carded athlete anymore in Canada. Basically you get a government stipend um, from the government if you achieve a certain level and they cut all that. And I just realized that I needed to figure out how to get into university pretty quick. So got a university. And then actually, ironically, because of, I think sports, I was a straight A student because I had this huge chip on my shoulder. I had not finished high school. And I thought, man, they're going to kick me out of this place. (laughs) If I literally have like a 3.9 GPA, I'm out. So uh, I I worked my butt off and um, ended up doing undergrad and graduate school. And uh, then also had another realization that getting a PhD really wasn't for me. I had that entrepreneurial kind of feeling in the back of my neck that I just didn't want to spend the next five, six years pursuing my PhD, got out of that, and then got back into entrepreneurship. And what was your your first real entrepreneurial endeavor? And outside of uh, maybe selling baseball cards or lemonade stand, what was your first project as an adult? So in... um, in grad school, I, after about seven years of being a teaching assistant, I was able to teach my very first class. And this was kind of like, this was the goal of graduate school was to teach. And very excited about it. I showed up for the very first lecture. I don't know if for people that have not been to university, usually you just hand out the syllabus at, um, at university for your first lecture. You don't actually teach, but I thought, no, I'm I'm so good at teaching. I'm going to give these guys a three-hour lecture. <laughs> and I went from 300 students to a little bit above 150 by the end of the year. I got the worst reviews in the history of the department uh, and realized that that really wasn't for me, um, and which also connected to me quitting <clears throat> grad school. But what I learned from that was I didn't like lecturing, but I really liked teaching. So I turned that into a virtual tutoring company and grew that to... 100 plus tutors throughout North America and Europe, um, specifically targeting pre-med prerequisites. And uh, built that company within a couple of years, sold it within a couple of years. And then literally from that company, one of the major problems that I had was the ability to be able to measure how long someone worked for me. Because I'd have a student that would say, hey, you build me for 10 hours with this tutor, but I only worked with this tutor for five hours. I'd go to the tutor and say, hey, did you work with Jimmy for 10 hours? And he'd say, of course, that's why I build 10 hours. So I'd end up having to refund the student for five hours and pay the tutor for the full 10 hours. And this was a problem. So uh, that's why with Rob, I co-founded Time Doctor, which basically solved that problem for the previous business. Can you talk about that first year starting a software as a service company? I mean, are you a developer? Did you hire developers? How did you get that off the ground? 
uh, with money. <laughs> We're bootstrapped, but uh, I think that that's disingenuous to be able to say I had some acquisitions and so did Rob. So we were able to uh, fund it. And uh, at that point, it was just, we were both non-technical founders. Uh, Rob actually runs the development side of the house. I'm more of the marketing and sales side of the house. And it was just a hard grind. It was uh, way back in the day, which was eight hours, or eight years, eight hours. <laughs> it was eight years ago. It was a lot of um, doing long-term strategies like SEO, um, doing a lot of even like forum posting, um, making sure that the software was solid, doing a little bit of paid advertisement, referral marketing, that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's just a hard grind. And once you kind of, particularly with SaaS inside of this business model, it's all about compound interest. So SaaS starts slow, but then arcs up. And now, I mean, 70% of our business is through referrals. Uh, so it's really, a lot of people think that SaaS is an outbound play. It's actually not at all. It's just build a really good product, get people to enjoy that product, and then they'll share it with their friends. That's the entire business model. Love it. Let, let's talk about hiring. I mean, you've obviously hired people for the first business that you sold. You're obviously, you have lots of people using Time Doctor for their hires. You have an internal team there. What is your mentality for hiring? What type of people do you look for? Uh, well, I mean, I think finishers probably is the biggest thing that I look for. I have a document for all of my direct reports, which is entitled Liam and his weird little quirks, which are nine very truthful statements about me. So I would go out and talk to your three closest friends, as an example, and I would ask them this question. What would you say to someone that's just about to meet you if you were going to work with them? And so they then told me, and then that's what I would put together in that document. So a lot of those things are maybe things that I wouldn't necessarily say about myself. Uh, a lot of that stuff is not necessarily uh, the nicest stuff to say, but it's very truthful. And the mission statement, kind of the thesis statement of this document is, I'd rather you make the wrong decision than none at all. Because we have employees in 32 different countries all over the world, we have over 100 people right now that just work inside of Time Doctor, it's uh, really important for people to make their own decisions without direct management oversight. So we look for people that can really just take action, move the rock forward, regardless of whether you're actually moving the rock in the wrong direction. We just want people to move. Uh, I don't really care whether it's the wrong direction because every decision generally is reversible within 12 hours. Makes sense. What about any bad hires? Any horror story that stands out to you? I'm sure you fired people, but is there any one particular story that stands out? Um, I mean, for us, we have a philosophy. Our retention is, is actually pretty high. Uh, so our termination rate is, I believe, 4% last year. Uh, and that was, a lot of the times it's someone stole from the company, uh, someone was trying to steal data outside of the company, and that's obviously an automatic termination. But in terms of just the wrong fit, they generally know that it's the wrong fit about two to three quarters before that termination actually happens. So a lot of the times, we kind of just sit down and say, do you want to take another quarter, you know, stab at this? You're not hitting your numbers. I'm trying to help you as much as humanly possible, but it doesn't seem like it's working where are we at? And generally with A players, they'll be the first ones to say, this isn't working. I should be doing something else. Yeah. And I think that's a great approach. I think a lot of people go into the, those meetings being like, like you need to step it up. Like you better hit your numbers. But my approach or the better approach that, that people or higher level leaders talk about is what can I do to help you? What am I not doing right? How can I support you to get better? And maybe there is something small that, that you can change or you can do to, to make it more clear or communicate better. But a lot of times, like you said, they, they might just not, they might just know it's not the right fit and there's nothing that you can do. Yeah. There's a great book that you can check out. Um, that, which is uh, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. So that was my personal problem in terms of management is I would not be radically candid with people right up front. And kind of the definition of that is if I saw that your fly was undone, I'd be like, Nathan, your fly, right? I would keep it quiet. So it's being radically candid, telling you there's a very specific problem, but I'm here to help you. So my job is to be able to make you successful as a direct report. How can I get you to your goals? Because if I can't get you to your goals, then we can't keep you in the company. 
but I'm here to be able to work with you. And that's a very non-aggressive way to be very direct and also make sure that no conversation, no termination conversation is ever a surprise. If it's ever a surprise with an employee, you did not do your job as a manager because they just, if they didn't know that that was coming, that's a major problem up for you. What are some other mistakes that you see entrepreneurs doing when hiring virtual assistants, freelancers, remote people? Lack of process documentation is probably the largest and most uh, problematic issue that we see. So the ability to be able to hire people and have proper, proper process documentation is completely different in remote first companies versus on-premise companies. In an on-premise company, like in an office that I would be in right now, I would be able to show you, Nathan, how to do my particular task the way that I want you to do it. But when you are 10,000 miles away, you can't do that. So you need documentation that you can digitize, put up in a platform, and then anyone can go in, grab that information, regardless of whether or not I'm on the same time zone, and then you can basically get that feedback. That's the biggest problem that I see with remote first companies. Most large corporate companies already have this type of documentation, but remote first has to act like a Fortune 500 a lot faster. Makes sense. I'll, I'll ask you a question that, that I get a lot, and I'm curious your answer. When is the right time for someone to consider hiring or start hiring? Oh, uh, I mean, so that's an interesting problem. It depends on your different department, but I would not be caught behind the crosshairs of, I now need to do this massive project and I don't have the capacity in place. So we hire just internally, we're probably doing about half a dozen hires a month. Uh, and for us, we probably are hiring, we, we need to hire if we're ever caught in a particular month where we need to hire someone to do a job inside of that month, then recruitment in HR is failing. So we need to figure out what are the next hires that we need to have down the pipe because we need a new BDR or a new researcher or a new marketing person or developer. We need to onboard that person for three months before they're actually useful inside of the business. So we need to think two to three quarters down the road, who do we need to hire right now? And we need to start putting in those specs to be able to make it happen. That's the biggest problem that I see is people are saying, oh, well, I need to hire 82 people right now and I have a 20 person headcount. That's a disaster. Uh, anyone that hires more than 50% of their headcount plus 50 people isn't a big problem because you're gonna lose the company culture. So people are just gonna get hired that you're not gonna really be directly connected to. Hiring is one of those things that for us anyways, takes a very long time to do. I, I want to talk about your conference running remote. And I want to start off by asking you, what is your opinion on remote? I mean, should every business be doing that in 2019? Are there certain businesses that should definitely have an office? What are your thoughts on that? It's 7% of the US workforce right now, and it's projected to be 50% within the next 10 years. If you are not working remotely right now, or if you don't have a remote work agreement in place, you will be left out in the next 10 years. 86% of developers, as an example, in the United States work remotely. This is something that is not just uh, you know, a happy little trend. This is something that's going to become the dominant way that people work because generally, uh, and most studies will show this, and there's a couple that I can point you towards. Remote work uh, makes employees 20% happier and it reduces, or 20% more productive, sorry, and it reduces uh, retention, or sorry, it increases retention by approximately 30%. So that in essence communicates happier, better employees. It is the single thing that you can do to be able to make your employees the most happy out of anything else. It's all the free lunches in the world cannot get away from working remotely. So for us building the conference, I mean, we really saw that as something that we wanted to champion and to talk about in a deeper way because no one's really talking about that right now. So we said to ourselves, let's kind of build this conference because I was looking for something that really served me. Um, there's tons of conferences about being a digital nomad as an example and, um, and just generally running a tech business, but there's nothing about, I have 100 employees, I need to get to 150 employees and I'm a remote first company. Or um, Marcy Murray as an example, who's the director of support for Shopify. She spoke last year, just about a month ago, and she had her talk about how she went from zero to 2,000 remote support reps in three years. Those are the stories that I really find inspiring and the ones that I can learn from because that's where I wanna be in the next couple of years. 
I, I love it. And I do have to say, and I didn't tell you this before, I work with a ton of remote businesses. I've heard nothing but good things um, about your conference. So oh, you, I, I think um, people should definitely check it out. Any other information you can share about the conference, about what people can expect, what people should attend? I think it's, it's not designed for people that don't manage uh, other remote workers. So I just really kind of need to get super laser focused. I think in any business, you have to figure out who your customer isn't as opposed to who your customer is. So we are not a conference for digital nomads. If you don't manage any remote employees, it's probably not the conference for you. If you are a company that's looking to go remote, then this conference is probably for you. And if you run what we call a remote first company, then this conference is definitely for you. It's everything that you could possibly learn about building and scaling remote teams. Definitely, especially if you're using virtual assistants, freelancers, remote agencies, however you're structuring your company. Liam, this has been awesome. Where can people find out more about you and what are you looking forward to the rest of the year? Uh, vacation. <laughs> uh, I just got back from Bali for the last month and a half and I'm, I'm tired. But uh, yeah, you can go to timedoctor.com to check out Time Doctor and runningremote.com to uh, check out Running Remote. Awesome, man. Thanks again for coming on. No worries.